In this video, we're going to begin discussing parabolic partial differential equations and how we solve them using finite difference methods. You'll see some similarities to the elliptic equations that we were addressing in the previous series of videos, but there will be some new considerations and some new aspects that we need to bring into the discussion for solving parabolic partial differential equations because of the fundamentally different mathematical character of the equations and the physics that they represent. In this video, I'm going to simply introduce parabolic partial differential equations and some of the aspects that we've already discussed in terms of their character, in terms of their properties, and then I'll provide an overview of the different techniques for solving such parabolic partial differential equations. So remember that elliptic equations do not have any characteristics. There's no preferred direction of propagation of solutions, so the solution everywhere affects the solution anywhere instantaneously. As we discussed in an earlier video, for parabolic PDEs, we now have one characteristic, so there's one preferred direction of propagation of the solution, and normally that's times. So in an unsteady or transient phenomenon, there's a preferred direction of propagation of the solution, and that's time. That's going to be the way we're going to imagine this in all the cases we'll deal with this in this chapter. However, remember that it could also be a spatial direction in which it's propagating. So even for steady problems, in some cases they end up giving us initial value problems, parabolic partial differential equations, because there is a preferred direction of propagation in a spatial direction rather than time. But we'll think of it in terms of the more common case, which is propagation in time. So these are initial value problems as opposed to boundary value problems, elliptic equations as we discussed in the previous chapter. So we could think, for example, in terms of the 1D unsteady heat conduction equation. Remember, for two-dimensional steady heat conduction, it's governed by Laplace's equation, which is an elliptic partial differential equation. So here, because it's unsteady, it's going to be parabolic proceeding in time. So if it's one-dimensional, we just have one spatial dimension x, and then time will be up. t is equal to zero along the x-axis. We have some initial condition, which is why it's called an initial value problem. We need the values of the solution at the initial condition. And then we're going to march the solution forward in time using a time step. So the numerical algorithm marches. We're going to talk a lot about marching. You're going to see me doing these marching motions all the time. So it's marching here in the direction of time, so the direction of propagation of the solution. Now we do need boundary conditions on the left boundary and the right boundaries. So you can think of this as like a metal rod. You have the two ends, the left and the right boundary, and we're looking for the temperature distribution along the length of that rod. So the left and right boundaries are at fixed locations in X, and we need to know the temperature. We need to know the value of U or its gradient, which is the heat flux at the ends. And then we're solving based on those boundary conditions and the initial condition at t is equal to zero. We're solving for the solution u as a function of x and t as we march forward in time. So that's the basic approach that we'll take. Now we could think in terms of a general unsteady 1D linear partial differential equation. So partial u partial t is equal to some variable coefficient a of xt times partial squared u partial x squared, then a first root of term, zeroth root of term, and then a forcing term. We'll look primarily at the unsteady 1D diffusion equation, which is just a simplified version of this without these terms, and the A is just alpha, alpha being the diffusivity. So this is so this is what we so this is what we were just talking about in the last slide. Unsteady one-dimensional heat conduction. That would be the case if U is equal to the temperature T. Or it could be diffusion of momentum if u is a velocity. Or it could be vorticity diffusion if u is the omega, the vorticity. Or if it's c, which is the concentration, then it would be mass diffusion. So any quantity that can be diffused in space and time is governed then by this equation. We actually looked at this equation using separation of variables, eigenfunction expansions, way back in an earlier chapter as well. The key here is that any methods that we develop for this equation can be extended naturally to this equation. The one thing I'll note, however, is that for this general form, the A coefficient has to be positive. Positive in order for it to be parabolic forward in time. If A was negative, then it would actually be parabolic back in time. So normally, A will be positive, parabolic forward in time. There are two classes of techniques for solving these parabolic equations. The first is method of lines and the second is marching methods. The method of lines is actually motivated by, back in the good old days when our computing resources were extremely limited, we would try to use existing tools to solve more difficult problems. So in the good old days, we might have a good 
ODE, an ordinary differential equation solver, but we, did, we couldn't really handle full PDEs. Not that we didn't know how to, we just couldn't on the computers we had. So in order to convert our PDEs into ODEs, we could use the method of lines. So basically the idea is you discretize the spatial derivatives only, not the temporal derivatives, just the spatial derivatives, and that will produce a series of ordinary differential equations in time, all of which then can be solved to get the solution for x and t by solving these ODEs in time. You could solve them using the standard predictor corrector, runga kutta methods, and so on. This technique, again, is kind of historical. This is not used widely today because we have obviously much more computing power and we're not limited to just solving ODEs. So what we're going to focus on here are the more common methods based on marching. So we'll solve the solution at one time step, march forward to the next time step, get the solution, march forward, get the solution. And in order to do that marching, there are two subclasses of marching methods, explicit methods and implicit methods. The idea behind an explicit method is that you have a single equation for your dependent variable at each grid point. So this is kind of like Gauss-Seidel that we use to solve elliptic equations. Gauss-Seidel is an explicit expression for the value of u approximated a particular grid point is equal to a whole bunch of things that we know. So there's only one unknown in the equation. We can solve for that in terms of things that we know. So same idea here. We're just going to have one unknown, so we'll have an explicit expression for that one unknown. That'll be the value of u at our current time. Implicit methods, on the other hand, instead of getting an explicit expression for just one unknown, when we apply the finite difference method to each point, we're actually going to get a set of algebraic equations, so actually a system of linear algebraic equations that we'll need to solve for the dependent variable for all the mesh points along a given time step. So we have now multiple unknowns, so it's an implicit equation. We have to solve the solution implicitly. So this is analogous to the alternating direction implicit method, the ADI method that we discussed for elliptic equations, where we apply the finite difference equation at each point, and we get a series of unknowns. All those equations for the unknowns are coupled together. It's a tridiagonal system of equations in ADI that we need to solve. So that's an implicit expression. There's more than one unknown. So we'll look at a series of both explicit methods and implicit methods, and we'll discuss the various pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages of each. We'll start with the easiest and work towards harder, but presumably better. So in the next video, we'll talk about these explicit methods. And I'll go through a series of three of them, starting with the easiest. In fact, it's so old, it's named after Leonard Euler, who invented calculus well before we had digital computers. So we'll start with very simple, we'll look at a couple different explicit methods, we'll identify some issues with these. In particular, we're going to have to look at stability. This is a new property that we did not have to worry about in the context of elliptic equations because it was an iterative technique, so we had to worry about iterative convergence. Now we're going to have to worry about numerical stability. We'll talk about that after we discuss explicit methods in the next video. Then we'll move on to implicit methods, which address some of the deficiencies of the explicit methods in terms of this numerical stability property. We'll look at multidimensional problems, more than one spatial dimension, and as we did for elliptic equations, we'll also look at nonlinear convector terms and how they can be dealt with within the context of these marching methods.